Welcome everyone to the Holistic Science Lecture Series. Today we have uh, Stefan Harding um, telling, talking to us about deep ecology and the healing of the earth. Um, for many of you, Stefan will be a familiar face. He has um, he co-founded the Holistic Science Masters here at Schumacher College, and he's been running the Holistic Science program for uh, for almost two decades. And so he is certainly well known around Schumacher College. Um, he's also he has worked very closely with people like James Lovelock, and also was very much involved in the work of Arnie Ness. So. Um, yeah, and he is now the Deep Ecology Fellow at Schumacher College. So without more ado, I'd like to welcome uh, Stefan and I'd like to thank you, Stefan, for coming and talking to us today. Yeah, thanks, Troy. It's a real pleasure. Um, and so I'd like to start with a little bit of music. This is a, this instrument is called a quattro and it's from Venezuela, where I was born. So just as an introduction to what we're going to do. some slides to show you. I hope you can you can bear with that. Um, how do I I'll share screen? Right. So this is where you should you see my mastery of this technology. Here we go. Share screen. Look at that. I hope you're impressed. I'm impressed. So that's well, so yeah, there we are. That's what we're doing. Okay. So um, since we're talking about the healing of the earth, we need to talk about the condition of the earth today of Gaia. And we know what that is. I mean, there's no point in dwelling on that. But we know that the earth is in a very, very bad state. I mean, that's for sure. I mean, shockingly bad. And one of the ways we can look at is that this has been analyzed scientifically is through this planetary boundaries concept, which you may have, you may be aware of. There's a, a certain um, indicators of planetary health, such as how much we've changed the climate, how much we've acidified the ocean, how much biodiversity we've lost, and etc. I won't go through them all, but you get the idea. These are indicators of planetary health, of Gaia's health. <clears throat> and this green area here <clears throat> is what scientists have calculated is the amount of damage that Gaia can tolerate by us fulfilling these needs of ours uh, without shifting into an uncomfortable state, either very, very cold or very, very hot. So you could say this is the safe operating space for Gaia, this green area here. So we can emit some CO2, some greenhouse gases into the atmosphere and they'll be absorbed by photosynthesis, et cetera. We can also, unfortunately, we can't help it, wipe out a few species, but you know, that, well, that's, the ecosystem will still function. We can have some nitrogen input, et cetera. So as long as we're within that green zone, we're okay. But if we go beyond the green zone, which is what we're doing, and that's what these red slices show, they show you uh, in 2009, how we fared with, with respect to each of these indicators of planetary health, you can see we'd already surpassed three of them. One of them, biodiversity, way, way beyond the safe zone. I mean, this is the extinction of species, with the sixth extinction that's now happening. And then, of course, with climate change getting worse, and then nitrogen, now we've exceeded the phosphorus limit. Some of the others, not yet. But that's, 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 we've got to heal this. If we don't heal this, this whole system, which we call Gaia, or, or the Earth system, if you like, will almost certainly tip into a very hot, very uncomfortable state for herself, for her living beings and for us. So can deep ecology help? What is deep ecology? Can it help? So we have a crisis of worldview, obviously. I mean, a, a, a culture that creates this kind of mess of its own planet has got a crisis in the way it's seeing the world. So we have a crisis of worldview. And if we want to explore why we have a crisis of the worldview it's very good to go to a philosopher you know i wouldn't go to a scientist for asking that sort of question i think you need a bloody good philosopher and of course the one i encountered was arnie ness really good philosopher very holistic deeply holistic did philosophy he was professor of philosophy at the university of oslo and he did philosophy in all sorts of areas democracy 
science, yeah, all sorts of things, until later in his life, he coined the term deep ecology when he retired from the university. Now, this is his mountain. Well, this is the mountain he loved in Norway called Hellingskarvet. <clears throat> and um, it's, it's his relationship with the mountain and with our relationship with the mountain that deep ecology is about. And that Arne mm -hmm. developed um, in the last phase of his life. I mean, for about 30 years or so, he gave all his attention to developing deep ecology because he thought that approach could really help us solve the crisis and heal heal the situation that I showed you with the planetary boundaries and everything else that's going wrong. So Arnie would tell us, if you ask Arnie, so what went wrong, Arnie? He would say, well, I'm going to put this very simply. There's, there's a guy called Galileo back in the 16th century, and he, he was a genius, but he told us everything, you, anything's, everything that, you, that, that has any value as in, in terms of knowledge can be, must be measured. If you can't measure it, there's, it has no knowledge value, whatever you think it is, it has no knowledge value. You may like the color, you may like the sound of the music, but that's not knowledge. Knowledge is the frequency of the note, the frequency of the color, that's knowledge. Wow, that was a stunning discovery, you know, really. And you, you found, they found they could manipulate nature with this, this discovery. So it you know, started having technological implications. Then there was, of course, Descartes. Arnie would tell us, you know, we'd be sitting with Arnie outside maybe obviously outside as much as possible maybe on the mountain with him and he'd say this is Descartes he told us the whole universe is just a machine dead you know when his followers like cut open live dogs to see how the workings of the, uh, the dog functioned and the dog screamed in pain Descartes said to his followers ignore the screams they're just the creakings of a machine I mean they really thought that now you can see why, where this is going. It's going towards the crisis that I showed you at the beginning. And then there's Francis Bacon who said, we, should, we humans should use this new science to, to, just, to extend our dominion of the whole race, human race over the entire universe, not just the earth, but the entire universe. I mean, boy, I mean, you can understand it. I mean, yes, you can understand why. They, it, was, it gave them tremendous power, which they, didn't, which they never had before, power against nature, which we'd never had before. So it's understandable. This, and we call this the whole thing the scientific revolution, Arnie would tell us. So that's, that, that would be his diagnosis, basically. And it's not just his, it's a common diagnosis that we have, when I, I've, I've ascribed to it myself, that the scientific revolution, although with all its, for all its wonders, actually told us the universe was a dead, meaningless bunch of molecules vibrating in a meaningless void, and that you better get used to it, mate, because that's all there is. That's, and of course, if you have that view, then, then, well, you might as well cut down that tree because it has no value. I can sell it, I'll sell it, but it has no value just being a tree. And you destroy nature, which is what we've done. That's it's very simple you know, analysis, really. So from, from the scientific revolution, um, we get the word ecology, which is, comes from science. Now my slides have gone all over the place, but never mind. From, you get the word ecology, which is the study of the rational quantitative study of the relationship between organisms with each other and their environments, okay? So that's from the scientific revolution. But what Arnie is saying is that that's not enough. I mean, it's very nice the scientific revolution gave us the science of ecology. That's my science, that's what I was trained in. Um, I, you know, I did my PhD in ecology. Um, but Arnie says, um, that's fine. We end up with loads of facts. How many blackbirds are there outside my window? How many worms do they eat per day? How many young do they produce? When is their peak breeding season? All kinds of things like that. It's fascinating. But none of that, says Arnie, which all of that which comes from the science, from science, from our scientific attitude to nature, gives us loads of facts, but it doesn't tell us anything about how we should be living in relation to those blackbirds. Should I hunt them? Am I allowed to hunt them? Can I do I ignore them? Do I encourage them? Do I put nest board? How do I live in relation to them? Those are value questions. And we have to value. What is the value we have to feel with our hearts? What is the value of the blackbird? And that's a deep question, which is, goes beyond science. And so what, what Arnie did was coin this new phrase, deep ecology, in which we, he puts together facts and values, this time not to create an ecology, a logos, a sort of logical understanding, but a sophia, a wisdom an ecological wisdom, which he called ecosophy, ecological wisdom, to complement ecology. I mean, they work with each other. So deep ecology is about reuniting what was split apart during the scientific revolution, 
facts and values, the heart, the soul, and the, 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 the re thinking, the reasoning, to put them back together again. And in that way, we can experience our own in individual, unique ecological wisdom. Every person can feel their own ecological wisdom, their own awakening into this amazing presence of our planet, Gaia. And from there, they can, they can, they can engage in meaningful action that's going to be helpful for solving the crisis. So in my view, there are three senses of this word deep, um, which constitute an ecosophy, okay? So three senses of deep. And here they are, and they, they work together as a feedback. So first of all is deep experience of connection with nature. And I'm going to give you a couple of examples. Then that leads, that's not enough, would say Arne, in, in developing our ecosophy, our own individual ecosophy, individual ecosophy, remember. I then have to question my life and how I'm living in relation to my deep experience. And that's not enough either, because once I've done my questioning or part of my questioning should be, how can, how can I offer my life in some way or something of myself? How can I commit myself to enhancing the deep experience of everyone and the whole of nature? So it becomes a sort of feedback loop. And when we do that individually for ourselves, we get our ecosophy. We are cultivating our ecosophy. Now, it's very important to focus on the individual here. It's a, every ecosophy is utterly and totally individual. You cannot adopt anyone else's ecosophy. It has to be yours. And that's, that's, that's where the work comes in, but also the reward. Okay, so let's look at deep experience. Okay, I'm very, I want to show you two deep experiences. The first one involves this amazing American, incredibly important American ecologist called Aldo Leopold. Those are his dates. He's one of the founders of the modern ecological environmental movement. And he wrote this masterpiece, I think published around 19, just after his death actually, called A Sand County Almanac, okay? I'm just going to read you a little extract from this. It's very famous, this. Um, so let's just set the scene before we go any further. Now, I'm showing you a wolf. Why? Because Leopold worked for the US government in, in those times. And part of his job was to help exterminate the wolf from the entire surface of North of uh, the United States of, of America. Get rid of all the wolves, kill them all, poison them, whatever, kill them all using science. And they were successful in that, of course, because they thought in those days that the wolf, um, well, they knew the wolf ate deer and they thought that God had put deer on the earth for hunters to enjoy shooting. And therefore the wolf was interfering with the enjoyment of the hunters. So they had to be wiped out. Plus, they ate the odd cow and whatnot, you know. So anyway, they, uh, Leopold was part of this effort, basically. He was part of this effort to wipe out the wolf. And he thought the wolf was just a machine or he was totally bought into the Cartesian scientific revolution worldview that the world is a dead machine. The wolf is a machine that is disturbing the bit of the machinery that we want, the deer. And so we can just take out the wolf like we can take a cog out of a machinery and maybe, you know, it's just a machine. Some, something else will take its place that won't be so bad. So that's how he felt when he was still in his twenties, you know, until one day this happened to him. And I would say whatever happened to him there needs to happen to all of us humans really, really fast. Otherwise, we haven't got a chance, I didn't think, of solving the crisis in time. So this is it's very important what happened to him, the deep experience. So he's walking through this uh, area in New Mexico. It's called the Gila Wilderness. He's walking through this. He's maybe in his 25, 27, something like that. He's walking through this wilderness with his friends. They've got their rifles with them because um, they never know when they're going to shoot a wolf, you know. So they really hate wolves. And they come up to this a cliff like this, which in American is called a rim rock. And they sit down to have their lunch. So can you imagine that? Can you imagine Leopold and his friends are sitting down to have their lunch? They're overlooking this river down below. It's wild, wild, wild. There's sunshine everywhere. There's no, you don't hear any lawn mowers or anything. It's just totally wild, totally wild. And very undisturbed by people, really. Very undisturbed. This is how it, this is very, very natural, I would say. Very natural. Just look at those mountains in the distance. Just look at those. Uh, and the mountains in the foreground, I mean, magnificent. So they're sitting there, okay? And then um, this is what happens. So now we, we, we come over to him. Okay, so here's, here's Leopold. I'm reading from his book. It doesn't take long. 
we were eating lunch on a high rim rock at the foot of which a turbulent river elbowed its way. Can you imagine that down there, this turbulent river? We saw what we thought was a doe, that's a female deer, fording the torrent, her breast awash in white water. Can you see that image in your mind? Does you really see that in your mind? When she climbed the bank towards us and shook out her tail, we realized our error. It was a wolf. A half dozen others, evidently grown pups, sprang from the willows and all joined in a welcoming melee of wagging tails and playful maulings. What was literally a pile of wolves writhed and tumbled in the center of an open flat at the foot of our rim rock. Can you see them in your mind? Just, just take a little pause and just see them playing with each other. You know, wolves are incredibly social animals. They love their children and they're, they're very cooperative. We've greatly misunderstood them. In those days, back to Leopold, we had never heard of passing up a chance to kill a wolf. In a second, we were pumping lead into the pack, but with more excitement than accuracy. How to aim a steep downhill shot is always confusing. When our rifles were empty, the old wolf was down and a pup was dragging a leg into impassable slide rocks. We reached the old wolf in time to watch a fierce green fire dying in her eyes. I realized then and have known ever since that there was something new to me in those eyes, something known only to her and to the mountain. I was young then and full of trigger itch. I thought that because fewer wolves meant more deer, that no wolves would mean hunter's paradise. But after seeing the green fire die, I sensed that neither the wolf nor the mountain agreed with such a view. Okay, so, so we have to ask ourselves, what, what did he, what, how did he live his life after that? I, mean, I hope you got some sort of sense of that. We'll look into what, what happened to him in a minute. But he started saying things like this. We are, after that experience, we are plain members of the biotic community. We're no longer in charge of the biotic community, like he thought he was, being able to control wolves and kill wolves. No, we're just members of the great community of living beings on this planet. Um, and so he had a very, very rap of turnaround in his worldview, totally. Um, I would say uh, he was guyed. That's the way I like to put it. You see, what interests me is what the way he talks about the mountain. He felt the mountain was a consciousness. The mountain, of course, um, he had a mountain in front of him, but of course the mountain is the whole of nature. He felt the whole of nature has a con he knew without a shadow of a doubt it was revealed to him that the whole of nature is a great consciousness which he called the mountain and that it had disapproved of what he had done and of how he was wiping out the wolves and wanted him to stop that doing that which he did because he was he was so you know he was so struck by that realization that the mountain that nature is a great intelligence that's a deep experience and he, he, changed, he stopped hunting wolves completely. He didn't stop hunting, but he stopped hunting, kill, persecuting wolves, absolutely. Um, and he became one of the, a really great ecologist. You can tell because he's got his binoculars and he's outside and he's smiling. Mm. So um, there's Arne. I want to show you uh, Arne. Now we're talking about a mountain. So I'd like to take you up Arne's mountain now. Um, to, to, to for another deep kind of deep experience with Arne. Okay, so here, here he is. Let's show you him again. And that's his mountain in 
southern Norway. Troy and I have both been there on separate occasions. We've both been up there. It's fantastic, isn't it, Troy? Really amazing. So there we are. We're going up the mountain. Now, this is my dear friend, Pering Val Hawkeland, who spent an awful lot of time with Arne. And he and I are teaching a deep ecology course together here at Schumacher College. This is a, an unabashed plug on the 28th of March to the 1st of April in 2022. So do come and meet Pear and me, I suppose. He's, he's wonderful. We're heading off up to Arnie's cabin. Look at the mountain. Can you remember what um, Leopold said about the mountain, that the mountain disagreed with his view that killing wolves was a good thing? That, can you feel, I don't know if you can feel in a photograph, but the sentience of this mountain, the presence of the mountain. This is totally wild. And we're going up towards Arnie Ness's cabin. Can you feel, I know it's very hard on, you know, PowerPoint and with Zoom, but try and, try and bring yourself into that scene. Imagine you're actually there, as I have been several times. You feel the intelligence of the mountain. It's obvious, there's the cabin and we go closer. We have to carry all our food. There's no running water, etc. We've maybe spent five, six days there. This, you think, thank goodness it's got double glazing because it's quite cold up there. And that's the view. And you see now we're in deep experience already. As soon as, uh, as soon as we start walking up, we're in deep experience and it just becomes a continuous flow of deep experience. And when we want to make a cup of tea, we have to go down to the lake to get some water. And when we boil up the water on a camp stove, we've brought up and we, there's pairing bar again. And we gaze out and we, what are we discussing? Look, look at that. You see that beautiful area there, look. What are we discussing? Well, we might discuss very deep questions like um, what did Spinoza mean when he said God is nature? And how does it relate to science? Why was Arnie so keen on what he called Spinozistic science? Okay, this is getting a bit too, you know, too, too much into it, but that's the sort of thing we would explore. Or other things, um, perhaps music, whatever. And then we live up here for, for as long as we can, as long as our food doesn't run out. And we just dwell. Like Heidegger said, dwelling, and Arnie loved this saying of Heidegger, dwelling in situations of in, inherent value. So it's just good for you to be up there. It's good for us to be so close to nature. It's very, very good for us. It's very good for our soul, very good for our being. It's essential. And our culture has lost the, the ability to do that. We, most of us don't know how to do it anymore. And that's why we're destroying the earth. And a saying from Arne, before we leave him, um, the smaller we come to feel in relation, sorry, compared to the mountain, the smaller we come to feel ourselves compared to the mountain. Of course, mountain, remember, for me, it's like a metaphor. It can be a flower. It can be a, a bacterium, a beetle, an, ele an electron. The nearer we come to participating or participation in its greatness. You see, that's, that's a deep experience. Um, they sound very poetic, these words, and they are. But it's an, it's, a, it's an experience in consciousness. It's a, it's a kind of consciousness, a different worldview. It's what we need to balance our science so that we can save ourselves before it's too late and save our planet before it's too late. So that's this mountain, Heiling Skavert, as a sentient being that can teach us. Mountains teach us. Nature teaches us. She's intelligent, immensely intelligent. We just have, we've forgotten how to listen. And these deep experiences don't have to happen in big scale like Leopold and Arne had, you know, it can happen potting some plants, just even in, a, in your city apartment, potting a plant or tending a plant, you can realize the being of the plant is another living being with an amazing evolutionary heritage involving symbiosis and various kinds of bacteria that started living one inside the other two and a half thousand million years ago, extraordinary things in that plant. You can also have a deep experience with other people um, doing some gardening or some ecological gardening together, like we do at Schumacher College a lot. You know, that, that sense of community with other humans and in nature, other humans in nature, with nature. That's, that's a very deep experience. Um, so there are all kinds of different deep experiences. Um, now we have Jung here. 
see if I can get him to work because he's not, there we are. So uh, the Jungian mandala, uh, what, what can help us develop our deep, ex our, our ecosophies? What can help us? Is there a psychology that can help us? And of course, there we have to bring in Jung, I mean, obviously. And his four functions, which are universal functions, our intuition. So to develop our, eco our ecological wisdom, we need our intuition of the living quality of nature. We need those intuitions. They can only be given to us by intuition, but we also need to sense nature directly with our sensing, with our direct touch, taste, smell, sight, hearing, real sensory experience, real sensory immersion in nature. Then we need feeling. Feeling, he says, is not about emotion. It's about um, valuing something. You remember we, we were saying deep ecology is uniting value and fact. You get to value through your feeling you feel the value of something you 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 you, ass you assess something in terms of its value for example is this house good for me is this house bad for me is this person good for me is it good to treat um this ecosystem like that or not these are feelings these are values we it's a it's a way of knowing that we have which of course is hugely under undervalued in our culture because we we value the opposite function which is thinking rational thinking and, and it's been known in psychology for ages, and long before Jung. I mean, the alchemists knew this very well, that these are opposites. So intuition is opposite to sensing and thinking is opposite to feeling. And we tend to have one dominant in ourselves. And the, 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 the journey of life is to cultivate our understanding of nature equally using these four ways of knowing in ourselves. And it's not easy. It requires, it requires a very strong commitment to do it, which is the cultivating our ecosophy. And in the center, if we do that, in the center, we have the deep experience. Um, and there's a very old name for this deep experience or for the, the being of this deep experience, which in Latin is anima mundi, which I really like, which is soul of the world. So this, this deep experience, you experience the world has a soul, an intelligence that is a soul. And the, a symbol for that is often the spiral and many indigenous cultures around the world in fact, I would hazard to say, virtually all of them had this understanding, as obvious, as plain as the noses on their faces, you know, that nature is a great soul. It's part of our human birthright, like breathing air, to know the earth as a great soul. And we've been deprived of that by, by our sad, I mean, with no evil intent, really, by our materialistic, scientifically based, well, a mechanistically based culture. I'm, I'm a scientist. I'm not anti-science. I love science. It's just that kind of science, the mechanistic science, unfortunately, that's done this. So if we put our intuition and our sensing together and our feeling and our thinking together, then we might have experience, we might experience the anima mundi and also Gaia. So it's the same thing, really. The soul of the world, the soul of the earth, Gaia. I mean, it's experience. You can experience. But you need all four. If it's anything, in my case, it's, of course, intuition and feeling. But you have to, the thinking and the sensing help so much. You, it's holistic, in other words. And some people who have cultivated this approach to deep ecology, integrating more intuition, feeling, sensing, and some thinking as well, of course, from systems thinking, are John Seed and Joanna Macy, if you want to follow up, both of whom have taught at Schumacher College, the most wonderful people, some marvelous contributions. Council of all beings and wonderful processes for experiencing the anima mundi and deep experience. So that's all deep experience, my goodness. Now deep questioning in cultivating an ecosophy. Well, when we deeply question, deep questioning, we can use the, this, this is, um, we can use a tree metaphor. This Peringvar gave me this, who I showed you earlier, with whom I'll be teaching later. Peringvar, this is his ecosophical tree. And he says, we can ask ourselves, are there many different kinds of deep experience? And we find, yes, there are many different kinds in, the, in this rich soil of the tree of ecosophy. We can discover many different kinds of deep experience, some on mountains, some in the bathroom, some in community, some looking down a microscope at bacteria, etc. I mean, infinite number, some to do with God, some not to do with God. And then we can ask, well, do all the, what, what do all these deep experiences have in common or rather do they have something in common? Is there something in common that people who have this wide variety of deep experience have in common? The question we can ask. And the answer seems to be, well, it seems that they do. So most people, Arnie did some research on this sort of thing, uh, who have 
these deep experiences, they would agree with a statement a bit like this, or like this, all life has value in itself, independent of its usefulness to humans. So this is um, the idea of intrinsic value, you know, that everything that exists has value, is important, just because it exists. Every electron, every atom, everything, it's important because it, it exists. Why, we don't know. This is, this is a deep intuition. We cannot justify this rationally. If we try to justify it rationally, we're just going to mess ourselves up psychologically. You can't. You just have to experience it. Two, richness and diversity have value in themselves. So people who have these kinds of deep experiences, they would say diversity, biodiversity is good. Cultural, human cultural diversity, are, they have value. They're good. And then the third thing we probably find people agree with, who have these deep experiences, is that, is that we don't have a right to reduce this richness and diversity of uh, life, and of cultures, unless we're satisfying vital needs. And then of course, there's a huge discussion to be had. What is a vital need for me, for you? What is a vital need? And aren't engaged in those deep discussions about vital needs. And we don't do that in our culture. We don't talk about vital needs. We wanna satisfy everyone's greed, as, as I think Gandhi said, there's enough for everyone's need, but not for everyone's greed. And then we, the science shows us the impact of the humans is getting worse. I mean. That's the planetary boundaries I showed you at the beginning. You cannot, you cannot get wriggle out of that now. And, um, and so um, there are many, various aspects of this impact, um, which are, come from our culture. And so we have to reduce our impact. And to do that, we've got to have a completely different way of seeing an ideology. We've got to have different politics. We've got to have two totally different economics and technologies and science included. They must change very radically in a deep ecology direction. And then if you accept these points, you know, for, based on your deep experience, you have an obligation to participate in contributing to the changes in a peaceful and democratic way. So those are, you know, those are, we found that people with many different kinds of experience, deep experience, especially at Schumacher College, tend, uh, generally tend to agree with the overall uh, schema here. And then the question is, okay, where do we go from there? That's what's called the platform, that's the trunk. Now everyone has to ask themselves, okay, what life path am I going to follow? And that becomes the branch. You know, one person might follow this branch, another this one, or one person might follow different branches. And then at the end of the branch, you have a fruit. And the fruit is an action. And when the action is done, the fruit falls, when it's ripe, the, the fruit falls and it fertilizes the soil of deep experience for everybody. So that's the sort of ecosophical tree. Um, and you, you can go further with ecosophy, um, because remember, Arnie was a philosopher, professional philosopher. So he liked creating sort of semi-rational schemata. And this is, this is quite interesting. What, you're, what, what we're doing here is, we're a person, we ask our student or our friend to articulate the deepest um, sense of what they mean, what, what life is about for them. Um, and in this case, relations are the core of meaning. So relationships are the core of meaning. And this person was, was very much concerned that relationships should, um, are deeply important. They give you meaning. They are meaning. Because that's a deep experience. Then what, what follows from that when all these different things follow for this person? It's quite complicated and we, we haven't got time to, to go into it. But for example, since relations are at the core of meaning, she would then say, okay, I must preserve relations. I must take care of relationships between people and, and nature, things and beings in nature. Um, there, and then she says here, okay, that, what does that mean for me? Well, relations with nature cannot flourish without environmental experience. In other words, I've got to be in nature to, to preserve, experience the meaning of those relations and preserve them. I have to be in nature. I have to spend time with nature. And there she, she says, well, you know, be, spend time in nature. Um, so you can see we could follow others, but the point is that there's a whole system here. One, one statement flows into another and the whole thing starts to become a kind of coherent approach to life based on this very deep experience, which is, I would call um, the ultimate norm, um, you know, the deepest intuition for example, his deepest, Arnie's deepest intuition or ultimate norm about 
what's going on here on, on in the universe he would express he expressed like this self realization exclamation mark and of course gandhi was talking about that arnie liked gandhi very much self realization the whole universe is engaged in a, a trajectory of self realization in some way that we don't understand it's beyond our understanding and then all sorts of things for arnie flow from that for example you know, he wouldn't consume this kind of thing, he wouldn't do this kind of thing, or he would choose to do this, but not that as a result. And that gives us, that's our deep questioning. And as a result of our deep questioning, we start to sense eventually, some sense of commitment is arising in us. And we start to feel that what we found in our deep experience is so charged with value and meaning and, and our deep questioning has helped us uncover that question, that meaning very much, much more than we ever expected. That suddenly or slowly, um, we start feeling a sense of commitment um, to the anima mundi, if you like, or to Gaia, if you like, or to the huge intelligence of the planet or the universe. We feel this commitment. We feel how alive it is. We know how alive it and how how intelligence and sentient it is and we realize we have to commit to working with it and that's the birth of deep commitment and then we have to choose a pathway for ourselves now when when people come to Shumaha College for example to study with Troy and myself and other folks and Judith on the MSc in holistic science um, you know you're coming to find an ecosophy for yourself you're, you're coming to work on your to develop your ecosophy uh, and we're all, we're developing ours at the same time continuously, of course. That's the joy of it. So we're deepening our experience. We're questioning each other and deep questioning everything. And then we feel this deep commitment to what we're doing and to the planet and to the universe. And that deepens our experience. And our ecosophy just grows. I mean, I think, I suspect it can grow without limit. I think it's a positive feedback. It just doesn't stop. You know? um, and you, it helps you deal with your with troubles in life as well. It's real wisdom. Um, and so the commitment, well, some examples of deep commitment, and then I'll stop. So I'll stop a little bit early. Um, there's the 350.org movement, um, you know, trying to li limit our CO2 emissions to 350 parts per million. Of course, that didn't work, uh, but it was a wonderful movement. There's a people down there um, doing that. And then and there's, the, you could say, Extinction Rebellion. That's a commitment especially if you're going to get arrested and not treated very well, you know, that's a commitment. And then there's, I should have had a picture of Greta Thunberg, who I deeply admire um, and her movement and what she's done. I think she's absolutely fantastic. That's a really deep commitment. And then there's another Swedish friend of mine, a friend, Swedish friend of mine, Helen Norberg Hodge, who's also deeply committed her life to creating or discovering or elucidating what she calls an economics of happiness not an economics for just for the sake of material growth, but for the sake to make us happy and not just us humans happy, make the whole planet happy, make all our fellow species happy. So those poor howler monkeys in the rainforests of you know, Brazil don't have to hear chainsaws cutting down their forests any longer, um, etc. you know. And at Schumacher College, um, well, that's been my commitment for the last 30 years, as Troy mentioned, and um, my commitment has been to the kind of education we've been able to develop at Schumacher College. It's extremely difficult to be able to develop this deep ecology, ecosophical education. The mainstream, I would say, slowly catching on to it, which is marvelous. But here we can go very far into, into developing. We have access to beautiful woods, to nature, um, to beautiful buildings like the old Poston, this, which is where the college is, will soon be returning to. Um, and and then we can create a sort of sort of world we want, which I, I imagine will be something like this. All these green areas are bits of forest in a in a large area of Poland, and in between you've got human settlements, small scale with um, local agriculture going on, and so any one person can plug themselves into a green finger like this, and walk all the way through into primeval forest, and they can also live in their local community and help grow to grow food or help with um, healing or whatever they do in their totally immersed in their local community. And that way nature will thrive. 
see this beautiful fallow deer and then the forest and there's a human structure quite well in tune with it and then there's biodiversity here and the whole planet can thrive and I think in this way the planet will be able to self-regulate um, her temperature and other key parameters now and in the future in the face of a very dangerously bright sun and I think that part of our role as humans is to help help her do that by living ecosophical lives we can only do this if we live ecosophically and to do that we need to have e e deep ecology for healing the earth thank you i'll just play a little bit of music to stop let's let you uh, have a little bit of music just to ponder what we've explored and then we'll have some time for questions you've got quite a lot of time for questions mm -hmm. 